Good morning uh, to all the participants and to all the panelists. My name is Tasneem Karim. I am uh, opening this webinar on behalf of the Director General of the GCIS, Pumla Williams. And I welcome you all on this chilly winter morning uh, to a webinar on how government can leverage social media in the fight against the pandemic and the vaccine rollout program. Uh, so I must say we have a really exciting and esteemed panel this morning. Our program director, Professor Ben Smart, who is the director of health at the Institute for the Future of Knowledge and other representative from the Institute uh, for the Future of Knowledge. Professor Mandla Khadebe, associate professor at UJ, professor at Admiral Mare, uh, research fellow at UJ and Lebohang Mulaisi, uh, a labor market coordinator. So greetings to everyone who's taken the time to join this webinar. And thank you for the opportunity to open the webinar and uh, speak about the importance of the use of social media, uh, because it's through engagements like this that we can exchange best practices in our effort to fight the pandemic on all fronts. The one thing that remains clear is that for the foreseeable future, the impact of COVID-19 will remain with our communities. It is therefore vital to share our collective experiences so that we can learn from each other as we chart a path forward at a time when social media such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and so on have become primary sources of information. The reality, however, is that they have also become vehicles for fake news uh, and misinformation. Therefore, the question our panelists must try to answer today is how we can use social media more responsibly. Our experience in South Africa has shown that communication is an essential tool in the country, country's mitigating strategy to combat the, the spread of the virus. Our nation's communication system, spearheaded by the GCIS, has played an instrumental role in the fight against COVID-19. The research shows that communication has been effective in reassuring South Africans and guiding their actions through the onslaught of the pandemic. It did help instill some hope that the country with the help of every, every citizen could turn the corner and emerge stronger after the virus had, had subsided. Research also shows uh, that the integrated campaign we used um, where we employed social media as one of the um, bouquet of uh, tools that we used uh, was effective in reaching uh, the public and on safety messages and what the public could expect um, and what the public should uh, do uh, to stem the, the tide of the virus. So there has been heightened communication on all fronts as we sought to inform, educate and reassure South Africans. Our push has been to constantly remind people that they are part of the solution and we focused on instilling behavior change by profiling everyday preventative measures, such as wear your mask, sanitize, and so on. We did foster greater compliance with regard to South Africans staying home and wearing a mask. Comparatively speaking, uh, again, our research shows that South Africa was largely successful and uh, even uh, won some recognition through the WHO for our efforts uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, in, in, in dealing with this infodemic. Um, I'm sure that's something the panelists might want to engage with and talk about how we take that uh, positive development and, and strengthen it even further. So in leading communication in this difficult period, we had to understand that the pandemic changed the way government would communicate and engage with citizens. Initially, our face-to-face -face or physical interactions that uh, GCIS um, has, has been used to uh, were limited with lockdown regulations and restriction me me measures. So we took a conscious decision towards a strong shift to digital platforms such as national portals, mobile apps, social media, WhatsApp bots, and so on. 
Um, and we found that even uh, with these, with, with communities that had previously not had much access to social media, it did, our, our efforts helped accelerate the spread of information and reach South Africans, uh, uh, even those who previously had no access to the internet. Um, so some of the hotlines that we set up uh, and a dedicated WhatsApp information service 24-hour uh, coronavirus hotline, as well as the websites sacoronavirus.co.za and the government website www.gov.za emerged as the first port of call for many South Africans looking for information on the virus and government support. Uh, the social media platforms, including the official government Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram accounts, also played a role in disseminating information and providing room for engaging with the public to answer their questions and concerns. Public service announcements were also part of the suite of communication tactics. We worked very closely with the broadcasters and television was used and has been shown in the research, especially um, uh, uh, news channels, uh, that they were highly effective. Uh, so we use these to broadcast messages regarding strategic decisions, reminders, and educational information. Uh, media briefings were also broadcast to community radio stations and community TV stations that have a far-flung reach into rural areas in the country. In addition to all of that, we also supported uh, this with loud hailing undertaken by the GCIS district, district officers, mainly in very deep rural areas where media doesn't reach uh, as, as far as, um, as we would like it to. Uh, so more than 1.1 million leaflets received from the Department of Health were distributed. Uh, daily updates were also done um, initially in 2020 um, and then less uh, daily and then less so in 2021. But as the third wave started rising, we've gone back to daily, um, almost daily briefings. And um, they do seem to have to be uh, one of the more impactful means of communication. So the media has been a vital partner and they have been provided with constant updates, including on um, many, of the, many of the fake news, uh, which seems to proliferate our environment. Um, so the arrival of COVID-19 has made the world realize that social media is the way uh, for people to remain connected, even if they are physically separated and unlike in 1918, during the flu pandemic, when people did not have the same sources of communication, social media is today making it easier for the world to quickly share information and support each other. At the same time, some people use social media to spread falsehoods and disinformation. It's been a difficult road uh, for the journey, although we have uh, joined with our partners at Africa Check and many other organizations to as quickly as we can uh, stamp a fake uh, the, the social media posts that we find uh, that we know to be um, incorrect or fake. Um, but as I said, it's been a difficult road. Um, and also the other side of it uh, the, is that while in, at what, in one way it's easier than in 1918, but it's also difficult in another way because fake news spreads so fast um, using social media. So it has become difficult to find trusted sources of information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. We have relied very much on the scientists that are part of the MAC advisory um, and the doctors uh, that are also um, managing um, the government, uh, the government program in handling COVID-19. So at the beginning of the pandemic last year, people grappled with too much information and many became susceptible to false and dangerous claims. 
it's another angle that uh, you know that we who think about how we use social media must explore um, going forward because there's also the possibility of information overload in this kind of environment. Um, since the arrival of the pandemic, for example, there's been places where people have reposted and shared false or fake news in the form of pictures, videos, news links, and so on. And they've done so unaware that what they've shared is fake, false, or dangerous. So therefore, as government, we, we have been encouraging people to think twice before simply sharing. Um, and to succeed in this, we have to empower people about how to spot fake or false news. We have, we have been encouraging the public to visit the official government website, uh, as well as sacoronavirus.co.za, which is the original source for all the latest news, speeches, and statements about the work of government. Um, but do we have other resources that the public can visit to verify news or help them to spot fake news? I'll leave some of these questions to be answered by our panelists who will unpack and identify handy resources uh, to both identify and report fake or false information. Our interactions today will set the groundwork for sharing knowledge on how to use social media to spread awareness of the COVID-19 pandemic. So let, it, let this just be the beginning. Let us continue to work uh, towards ensuring that social media is used responsibly and to empower people uh, in the use uh, and consumption of social media. With that, please let me welcome you once again and hand you over to the facilitator for today, Professor Ben Smart. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tasneem, for that fascinating introduction to what promises to be a uh, really interesting and worthwhile debate this morning. Uh, let's crack straight on with our uh, first speaker. I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Nicholas Crisp. Uh, Dr. Crisp is a medical doctor and public health specialist. Uh, he was superintendent general of the Department of Health and Welfare in the Limpopo province from 1994 to 1999. He has worked on health-related projects in several other African countries, including Nigeria, Ghana, Lesotho, Botswana, Namibia, and Tanzania. In 2009, Dr. Crisp served as special advisor to Minister Barbara Hogan. He was intimately involved in establishing the National Health Laboratory Service, the transfer of the uh, medical legal mortuaries from police to health, and the creation of the forensic pathology services, as well as the establishment of the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority. He is currently working with the Minister of Health on the implementation of the National Health Insurance Fund, and like everyone else, was diverted to support the COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Crisp, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Ben, and good morning to everybody. Thank you very much. A very busy time for all of us, I know, but uh, I guess it's quite exciting because we are finally on a very steep curve for vaccinating our population. So um, I was asked to talk about uh, just briefly a little bit of insights into the vaccination program and to talk about the variants and the vaccine rollout, our race against time. I'm going to show one or two slides in a moment just to show what we have been able to do. But just before I do that, just to say to everybody, this is a changing landscape on a daily basis. And we have so many moving parts, it's extremely difficult to anticipate what's coming next. We've seen from the beginning of COVID at the beginning of last year, the first wave, the second wave and into the third wave, rapidly changing variants of the, the structure of the virus. Uh, I don't want to go into the science of how it happens, but it is viruses are mutating all the time to try and survive what we throw at them. And sometimes they do it extremely efficiently and it's very difficult for us to respond. And what we do as humans, well, as, as beings, is we make immunity that uh, confines or constrains that virus from replicating in our body and from being transmitted to others. And sometimes we do it efficiently and sometimes we don't do it efficiently. And sometimes the virus uh, is changing so fast that our ability to make immu an immune response is just not fast enough to prevent uh, the, the, the disease from being transmitted. And I think we all know by now that this is uh, droplet spread primarily and it's, so it's in the air. And it's what we do with covering our nose and mouths that really make the big difference about whether we are transmitting the virus or not. 
So the many moving parts are that we are social animals. We need to be in contact with other people. We need touch and cuddle and, and to be able to talk to our children and our families. And that is the enemy at the moment, because it's through that human interaction that we spread the virus. So we can't go forever telling people not to have that human interaction and to maintain safe social distance or to avoid crowds. I mean, that's who we are. We, we, we interact with other people as human beings. So we need to have other ways of dealing with um, the prevention of the spread and the prevention of severe illness. So before I show these two slides, we'll show you some of the numbers and what we are chasing at the moment. Um, the, the vaccines that have been developed stimulate our body to make an immune response. And there are different kinds of vaccines. There's the old method of where we take the actual virus, we take the protein from the virus, we introduce it into a person's body, and it, uh, we, the body then makes a reaction to that protein. But it's not the actual virus. It's just the protein of the virus that we introduce. And then there's the other one, which is the new vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, where we take the genetic material in a laboratory, remove the genetic material, and administer, you know, make large quantities of it, and administer the genetic material of the virus that our bodies then use to replicate the immune response. So they are different virus, uh, different methods, but they have the same impact. The idea is for us to make Im immunity so that we don't uh, uh, get sick and we don't transmit the, the virus to, to other people. Now for us as a program and globally, what we are trying to do is two things essentially. The one is to prevent the vulnerable, the most vulnerable from getting sick because they then get severely sick and end up in hospital or dying and it overwhelms the healthcare system. That is the prim primary thing that we have been trying to achieve up till now. Then once there are large scale quantities of vaccines, the second objective is to get enough of us to have an immune response basically simultaneously. So we break the transmission of the virus and that we call herd immunity or uh, community or population immunity are other words that people use. We don't actually know because we haven't lived with the viruses for long enough. We haven't lived with the vaccines for long enough. We don't actually know at what point that threshold of herd immunity may or may not work. And we don't certainly don't know whether we can get fast enough to enough people to have only a small proportion of the population vulnerable and therefore create herd immunity because the virus is mutating fast enough. So our primary concern is still to vaccinate people who are most vulnerable. Now, there's been lots of debate about it. But the evidence at the moment and the evidence for the last couple of months has been the number one risk is people over the age of 60, by far more vulnerable than anyone with any comorbidity is age over 60, which includes me and a whole bunch of my friends. So those of us who are in that age group, irrespective of whether we have any comorbidity, are the most vulnerable then between 50 and 60 is still more vulnerable than any other comorbidity. And it's only in the 40s that it starts to draw even with the various comorbidities that we know about diabetes, hypertension, and so on. So our thrust and our major objective is to get to the older people as fast as possible. And the risk we run is as we open the the age bands, and we try to vaccinate more people as fast as possible now that vaccines are genuinely becoming available in numbers, is that we leave the elderly behind and we still sit with the problem of them getting sick and clogging up the hospitals and dying, and that we want to avoid at all costs. So with your permission, I'll just show two slides that uh, give us a better insight to where we are at the moment. I hope you're able to see uh, this slide. So this is data from 29th, 8 o'clock this morning, of where we are in the administration of vaccinations. So we're using two vaccines at the moment. The Johnson & Johnson is what I referred to earlier about the protein that's the old technology 
of vaccines that we are used to, and it's a single dose vac uh, vaccine. And then the Pfizer vaccine is the newer technology, and it's a two dose vaccine. So when you have had one dose of Johnson & Johnson, you are regarded as fully vaccinated. And only when you've had a second dose of Pfizer are you regarded as fully vaccinated. So one dose conveys substantial protection against severe illness. And that's what we want to do for everybody so that we protect the elderly in particular. And we need to get to the second dose so that we get good immunity to prevent the transmission of, of, uh, the, of the disease. So I, you know, I'm trying to simplify some quite complex scientific issues into everyday life of how it affects us. So how have we succeeded? Well, I'll show you another graph in a moment, but we have vaccinated as of this morning over 7 million people, 7 million vaccinations that we have done. And they started with the Sasonki program, which targeted healthcare workers so that we would protect them from while so that they could care for us when we get sick. And the uh, total number given was at, at 400, and, it was 479. We've been back capturing some paper records. It's up to 489 now, 1,000 doses. Primarily healthcare pr practitioners, but some uh, support personnel are included in this. And this number continues now to rise as more people come forward. Since the 17th of May, we have also vaccinated 903,000 people or doses given, but that is people with Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And this is exclusively, almost exclusively now, except in the last week, been given to the essential public services programs like social development, the police, the defense force, and so forth. So this is combined 1.4, just under 1.4 million people completed vaccinations. In the community rollout since the 17th of May, we have done 4.376 million Pfizer first doses and 1.3 million second doses. That's given 42 days after the first dose or longer, not, not shorter, it can be longer. So we have administered 5.68 million doses since the 17th of May. And you can see by province in these bars below who, where the concentration of these vaccinations has taken place. These are purely numbers, they are not percentages. So you would expect it to be proportionate to the size of the population, which indeed it is. Gauteng, KwaZulu-Natal and Western Cape are the, and the, are the most populous provinces and have done the largest number of vaccinations. You can also see where the first doses are and the second doses starting to pick up in each of the, of the provinces. So I'll show you one more slide. So this is now the number of people vaccinated, remembering that some people get a single Johnson & Johnson vaccine and others get a two-dose Pfizer vaccine. So the number of people vaccinated is 5.769 of the million people. So that's now very close to 10% of the total population of the country has been vaccinated. And what we do is we look at fully full vaccination of those who have had one Johnson & Johnson or two uh, Pfizer. And these figures are globally reported for comparison sakes from one country to another. And you can see the distribution by province. I won't go through it. And here in, on the dashboard, you can also see by district. And what we are in the health department and in the vaccine program are looking at is each district. We are watching to see how well we are doing in individuals vaccinated. And we are watching the rolling seven-day average uh, and the total number of individuals vaccinated. So you can see the general trend as we've had more vaccine is up, up, up. And the dips are weekends where we still have a lot of problems vaccinating people uh, because of staff shortages and other organizational challenges. And you see these little peaks that occur uh, and those are when major public sector interventions are taking place. So while you're watching that side, I'll make my last comments. The challenge for us, as I said, is to continue to get older people vaccinated. So while we bring younger people and other target groups, and let's call them priorities, if you'd like, people to vaccination, they are not the most vulnerable. It's those within the groups that are over the age of 60 and 50 that we must continue to reach. And our messaging must really continue 
to ask the young people to bring their parents and their grandparents for vaccination. So we are in this week is the least vaccine we've ever had in the system. And we are geared to do well over 300,000 vaccinations a day. But we've got this little window of this week where we have not yet received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And our big Pfizer vaccine uh, amounts only start to arrive on Saturday. We have received some vaccine last Sunday, another 960,000 doses. But the main vaccines really start to arrive on Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, and the week after that. Uh, and maybe we're lucky and we get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine tomorrow, which would be really nice. Once those vaccines arrive, we will have at least 50 vaccinating days of vaccine in the country. And then we can really go, go flat out and we can grow this graph at exponential rates because we are prepared on the ground to be able to manage that number of vaccinations. From a communication perspective, the, the public don't hear the fine details in the messages. The public hear the messaging of the big headline announcements. And we are already being accused of telling stories that where anybody can walk in anywhere, anytime and just get a vaccination. This is not buying sweets at the shop. People can come and we encourage people to register before they come so that their paperwork is done and they may just arrive. But there will, there's no guarantee that there will be vaccine, vaccine at that site because you only take out so many doses per day based on the amount of vaccinations you're able to give in a day. So it is still better for people to register on the system. And now that the system is full and got a lot of sites and so forth, for people to be scheduled uh, to ensure that there's a vaccine available for them. But if they do walk in, they will have to wait until the older people have been vaccinated. Uh, the younger people will wait for the older people and they will be seen if there's a vaccine available on that day. There's a race against time, as I said, but the biggest race is to get as many of the older population as is possible vaccinated as we possibly can. I think I'll leave it there. I'm sure there are gonna be questions later, but thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share this. Thank you so much, Dr. Crispin. Thank you for joining us uh, and for your interesting, insightful talk. Um, because I know you have to leave, uh, I'm going to open it up to questions now for you. For, for the other speakers, we're going to do questions at the end, but I know you can't stay right until the end, so we'll open up for questions. Please, um, uh, participants, type in the Q&A. But whilst I have you here, Dr. Chris, <clears throat> so the, the rate at which the over 60s um, were getting vaccinated was beginning to drop off before we opened it up for the over 50s and now for the over 35s. Um, now, I would imagine this is down to a combination of um, vaccine hesitancy amongst uh, some people, um, but also uh, perhaps uh, difficulty accessing vaccination sites and, and so on. Now, obviously, opening it up to over 35s helps indirectly once people are fully vaccinated, at least, because then, you know, we can reach herd immunity. But that's, again, going to require the two doses of the Pfizer. And it could be quite some time before uh, we're vaccinated against actually contracting the virus. So that still leaves the over 60s at risk. I was wondering, do you have any ideas on how to uh, increase uptake amongst the over 60s that, that still haven't taken the opportunity? Uh, despite it being open to them for months now. Yeah, thanks very much, Ben. So one has to have both passive and active strategies. So part of the passive strategy, but I guess it's an active communication strategy, is we have been asking younger people to bring their parents, their aunts and uncles, their grandparents, people older than themselves, who may have less access to transport, a little bit hesitant with the technology, don't necessarily have access to the technology. Um, and we have also now got, thanks to GCIS, a uh, lot more languages out there, so that that's one more barrier that's removed. So the, the messaging needs to continue to ask families to come for people to bring older people and to facilitate their registration and their vaccination. We also have a very proactive program now running at the SASA sites, where there are mobile teams that go to the pension pay points to physically reach people. 
Now, while we didn't have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in our arsenal for this period of the, with the FDA, we were having to use the Pfizer vaccine. And it's very difficult to get back to this particular community for a second shot. So what we are now able to do is we will get Johnson & Johnson vaccine specifically to this group so we don't have to go back to them. Much easier to vaccinate someone at a vaccination, at a pension pay point site, let them go and know you don't have to go back to them again. But then there's also outreach in communities. And we have seen in particular very, very proactive uh, engagement by political, religious, and other leaders in Limpopo who have exceeded all expectations, way beyond what the urban provinces have done. Village by village, community by community, they've gone to the communities and actually got people to come out of their homes and targeted the older population. It's been an, a remarkable success, but we need that to happen in townships. The urban areas are trailing way behind. And I know that the social dynamics from one community to the other is quite different. But if we don't physically go out and look for people and engage them, they won't just passively arrive and get vaccinated. So I think it's a multiple strategy. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have a question here from Agadi Mozzetto. Uh, Dr. Chris, good morning to you. The government and health messages on how the vaccines work against the virus are confusing. We've had vaccines for measles, which meant the infections won't be severe. Does vaccinating mean you can't get infected and infect others with the virus? Okay, so thanks very much. It's a very good question, and I'm afraid it's not a very easy answer. So no vaccine is 100% effective against any disease because our bodies make immunity in different ways. Some people don't make any immunity at all. People who are on steroids for whatever reason for their other conditions don't make uh, immunity well. People whose immunity is suppressed by another illness that they might have may also not make immunity very well. So vaccinating somebody is not immunizing them. If you are malnourished, like in the old days, we used to see a lot of malnourished children, we would vaccinate them and we'd count it as an immunization, but they never, those children were never able to make immunity. So the message is, you need, your body needs to be able to convert the stimulus we give you with a vaccine for you to make enough immunity for your body to fight the virus. The vaccine itself is not a medicine. It does not treat anything. It creates the capacity of your body to fight. So the, the, what you do, though, is you raise the amount of immune response in your body through a non-threatening, uh, non poisonous, if you like, or non-virulent is the word we use. So it's not an aggressive thing that's going to kill you, which the COVID virus can do. Uh, we give you a milder form of exposure to the material, the protein material. And then that means that next time your body recognizes that you make a, an immune response. But it does not, it's not a silver bullet that says you will never get the, the disease. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, we have a question from uh, Stambiso Sitol, uh, Sitole, excuse me for the pronunciation. It's a media specialist from Newsroom Africa. How do you deal with the misinformation and stigma when it comes to vaccination? Yeah, thanks. Another very good question. Um, so for me, the point is to convey the facts and make the facts very available to everybody. And with social media and with all kinds of conspiracy theories and so on, it, it will remain difficult. But we have to be consistent. These are the facts we know of today. And for those of us who have grown up and lived in health sciences, we take a lot for granted because we are taught to work with the evidence. So you go out, you do something, you treat a patient in a certain way, and you watch how, what's the response. And we know there's a range of the way people respond to any treatment we give them. And there will always be some who don't respond and some who respond very quickly and very well. And that's the evidence that we provide. We need to convert, as scientists and medical practitioners, we need to convert that evidence into language that the lay public who don't understand or don't have time to engage with the science can uh, readily interpret it. And you have to just put it out there again and again and again and again. The challenge with COVID in particular has been that the, the, the evidence has changed. The variant changes. The way in which the vaccines work changes. So we are constantly having to second guess our own science because it, the virus is working a little bit ahead of us all the time. 
And I mean, everybody knows we, we stopped using AstraZeneca vaccine before we even started using it because we had that beta variant at the time that did not respond to that vaccine. But now we have a Delta variant and actually the AstraZeneca vaccine now works against this variant. But by the time we are able to introduce an AstraZeneca vaccine, we may have a Lambda variant and it may or may not work. And the public get confused and say, don't you know what you're doing? The answer is we do know what we're doing, but the virus is outsmarting us all the time. Thank you. Uh, here's an interesting question. So uh, Sarah McCorba uh, asks, there has been news around the country that people are dying after they have been vaccinated. And that is creating a serious fear for those who are still to be vaccinated. Uh, how is government dealing with this myth? Are you aware of it? And how are you intending to deal with it? Sure. Yeah, no, uh, thanks very much. So yes, surely we are aware of it. We get notified immediately when someone dies, especially if somebody dies after a vaccination. And there's a very clear process. Again, it's a process that uh, GCIS is very engaged with at the moment. We have a, a global system called AEFI, Events Following Immunization. And the AEFI methodology is standardized across the world and it's a way in which we have people, uh, health practitioners in the country who investigate every single notified adverse event. And of course, we're very concerned about deaths. And what they try to do is they try and collect the evidence from the medical files and the, the details of the person's condition about what caused that death. So just because you vaccinated and you die doesn't mean the vaccine caused the death. In fact, so far in South Africa, we have no, no one uh, death after a vaccination that can be causally linked. It's not to say it's not possible, but so far we don't have any. Those people, the vast majority, and the reports I've seen definitely, uh, had other illnesses prior to being vaccinated and may well have died with or without the vaccine within the same short space of time. To communicate that and to explain to people how causality links, you know, I did A and as a result of what I did, it, this is why I died, or I did A, but I was in any case sick and I might have died or I might have got worse, are two completely different things. And uh, the process of determining that follows a very strict global procedure so that we don't make mistakes. And sometimes we go back and we review those uh, processes with different teams on some kind of an appeal to make sure that we are reporting as much as possible, uh, as much as possibly accurately what the actual situation is. Yes, thank you. I, I think that's so important for people to, to learn this idea of causation. I was listening to uh, 702 yesterday and there were people calling in absolutely convinced that it was, uh, it was the ivermectin that had cured them of their, of their COVID, of course. Mm. And, you know, this is based on purely anecdotal evidence one person taking ivermectin and getting better, when of course 98% of people who get COVID also get better. I may as well just say that the morning cup of coffee helped me get better. You know, there's, you need studies, you need evidence. Uh, and without this kind of thing, you know, you can't, you just can't draw causal inferences like that. Um, okay, anyway, I, I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. And um, this one I think is, is important for us that have a, an audience. Uh, Dr. Chris, what would you like us as communicators to do differently uh, or better to get the finer messages across to the public more effectively? Uh, also a lovely question. Sure, this is a nice uh, webinar. Thank you. Um, so I'm one of those glass half full people, and I believe that we, we need one another, that it's not the health department or the health practitioner's problem to solve my health problems. I believe I have to be an active participant in that. And the media is extremely powerful in getting that message across. If I look after my neighbor, it's in my interest, even if it's for selfish reasons, but it shouldn't be. If I make sure that everybody around me is protected because I'm diligent with my mask, I wash my hands and I engage and I get vaccinated and I make sure I'm informed and so on, then I protect myself, but I also protect everybody around me, not just my nearest and dearest, but everybody. The second thing is that we have got into a spiral as South Africans that we think that everything we do is badly, is bad, and everything that government does is bad because we've broken this trust over a long period of time. We as South Africans, forget about that I work for government now, and I'm new in government, I've only been here two months. We in government and we as citizens have got to take control of our lives. And when we see things that are positive, we must 
acknowledge that it's positive. When we see things that are negative, we must confront them and we must deal with them so that we convert them into positive for the next time around. So I think that the media, and I, I must say, I think the media generally has done pretty well on reporting what is going on and how, and has given praise where praise is due and so forth. But repeatedly repeating the facts and congratulating the nurse in the clinic or the doctor's rooms or the pharmacy that's done well or the people in KwaZulu Natal who have bounced back from the disasters of the past couple of weeks and actually got the vaccination pro pro program going builds confidence in all of us. And I would like to see that in the media. I don't want motherhood and apple pie. I, I would like to see the facts and I would like to see when something is um, not done well, that it is reported accurately and factually. But in the beginning of the epidemic, when I was before I joined the department and was monitoring the media, there was just this constant, you will never get it right, you can't do it, government can't do anything. And I don't think that's helpful at all. I think it's more helpful to be a little bit uh, positive about we as citizens, we as South Africans can do this. Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, let's do two more questions. I'm sorry to everyone whose questions isn't gonna get answered, but we do have to move on at some point. Uh, but I'll ask uh, these last two. Uh, is it true that one needs to test for COVID-19 before being vaccinated? Uh, it's said that if you are COVID-19 positive and vaccinate, you expedite your risk of dying. Okay, so thanks very much. No, you do not need to test. We do not encourage that you test. If you are symptomatic, even if mild symptoms, then you should stay away from vaccination. Even if the symptoms are due to some other illness, you should stay away from vaccination because those symptoms are a result of your body making immunity and, uh, and, and trying to fight off whatever the, the illnesses that you have. So if, you, if we now introduce another stimulus to your immune system, it can make you feel lousy. E even to a well person, when I've had one vaccination, uh, e even when I got that one, the next day I really didn't feel great. But the day after that, I was back to my normal self and I was fine. But had I been sick with something else and got vaccinated, I may well have precipitated a worse illness. And fortunately, I have no comorbidities, but had I had, I may have made my, my life a lot worse. So the, the responsible thing to do is to just stay away from vaccination until you know you are healthy, go for the vaccination, and then uh, know that you may get your body fighting against that protein may make you feel lousy for a period of 24 hours or so, and then you'll be fine. But vaccinating, even vaccinating someone who's ill, is not the vaccine is not going to kill you. It's uh, highly, highly, highly unlikely. And we have discussed this question of causality a moment ago. Uh, the, co the causal link is not the vaccine. It will be something else. I'm pretty sure of that. A uh, quick follow-up to that. Uh, if you've had COVID-19 and tested negative, how long should you wait after testing negative before taking the vaccine? Okay, so the guidance at the moment is that 30 days after your symptoms, your body should have restored to the, to the status quo of your immune response, and you should be absolutely fine. Uh, if you come sooner than that, you probably still got an immune response in your system and you, are, you may feel worse reactions. We know that's why we, we spread the two doses as well after 42 days. In the beginning, we were doing 21 days and we were seeing um, more um, severe responses to the second dose than the first dose. But we know at 42 days, you seem to have a, an immune response, but not a, an aggressive and active immune response. So the guidance now is 30 days after symptoms, you should be absolutely fine for a vaccination. After the end of symptoms or after the onset of symptoms? No, after the end of symptoms. So either um, 42 days or, well, they say 35 days should be enough from the, from the time of your diagnosis. It's not, we're all different and our degrees of our vaccinations are different. If you are absolutely fine and you've been fine for 30 days, that's really your rule of thumb you should be absolutely fine for a vaccination. Okay, thank you. And just one last question. South Africa is, uh, claims uh, Sonia Mabunda uh, Kazaboni, uh, comparatively lagging behind on vaccinations in the Southern African region. Uh, why is this so and what can we do differently? Okay, well, that was so uh, until last week, but I'm pleased to announce that we are ahead of the game again. Uh, so there were two reasons why we got behind. The one is we didn't have vaccine. 
we had procured AstraZeneca vaccine and we had to abandon it. And then we couldn't get other vaccines in time. And we have been very, we've, we have found it difficult. We do not, we are not able to get donated vaccine from the COVAX facility or have not until tomorrow uh, been able to do that. Uh, we've had to purchase our vaccines and compete on the international market. So the, the slow start to getting going was uh, getting vaccines. And even up to now, our ability to get sufficient vaccines is really our, our, big, our big challenge. In the next 10 days or so, we will have brought into the country enough vaccines for the next 50 vaccination days. That's two and a half months. So we, were, we are going to go flat out and we have the system is built now to be able to handle 1 million vaccines every three days. So I'm pretty sure we're going to pull, we're going to pull our socks up now and do a really good job. That's excellent news. Uh, Dr. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of uh, the Institute for the Future of Knowledge and, of course, on behalf of the participants. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you um, all very much and keep up the good fight. I'm sorry I have to leave you. I would have liked to stay. Shame. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Until next time. Uh, Bye. Right. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Professor uh, Mandela Radeve. Uh, professor Radeve is an associate professor in the Department of Strategic Communication at the University of Johannesburg. He is a communication professional with over two decades of work experience in industries, including accounting and auditing, financial services, information and communication technology, higher education, retail and the public sector. Professor Mandler has been involved in numerous policy formulation and develop, uh, development processes. Until December 2020, he was the business executive responsible for communication and stakeholder management at the Auditor General of South Africa. He is the author of Constructing Hegemony, the South African Commercial Media, and the Misrepresentation of Nationalization, published by UKZN Press. Uh, Professor Radebe, are you around? Yes, I am here, Professor Smart, and thank you very much for the opportunity. And good morning to everyone who is here. I hope I'm loud and clear. In the yes, interest of thank time, you for us. thank you very much for the introduction. In the interest of time, I will skip some of the slides because uh, I think there is more interest on the vaccination process. But I think that the, the topic for discussion today was on the social media as an avenue to disseminate information in the current crisis that is facing the world, not only the country. But in doing so, there's just a disclaimer that I would like um, to make, and I hope my, everyone can see the screens, that, the slides that I'm sharing. I think the first point in talking about social media that we must do, we must make, is that just like any platform economy, uh, social media is value laden and therefore it is not uh, class neutral. Uh, on the contrary, social media platforms are largely located in the production and the reproduction of the capitalist ideology. I think it is very important that I make that disclaimer up front. And, but also part of the disclaimer that I wanted to make was that uh, in the absence of this class neutrality that I'm talking about, uh, not only do such platforms as social media reproduce the dominant ideology, but they are also a key site for the construction of the dominant ideology in society. By, by also perpetuating the class exploitation, uh, particularly of the working class. Of course, this debate, um, in my view, must be situated in the emergence uh, of concepts such as uh, digital colonialism and digital imperialism. If you look at our context, for example, as the African con uh, continent, uh, but also taking into account uh, the entire global South is that we, we, we are already subjected uh, to what is emerging as digital colonialism. Therefore, I think it is important for us that when we talk about uh, the use of social media in this day and age, we take these things um, uh, into account. So there's a disclaimer that I thought I should make uh, upfront before I proceed uh, with, the, with the presentation. So when we talk about COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, it has become known as the social media pandemic precisely because it is the first real pandemic that is taking place or that has emerged in the context of technologically driven and powered uh, social media. 
The fact of the matter is that in, in this day and age, any crisis that occurs, it becomes a social media crisis, therefore requires a social media management strategy. And at the heart of the, of, of the COVID-19 crisis is the need by governments across the world to, to engage their citizens to manage uh, and mitigate concerns such as the, the panic. Uh, I mean, we all, all of us were panicked when the, when the disease came uh, to the country. There is fear, there's anxiety. So to create the understanding and how the crisis is managed, for example, the, the input Dr. Chris was making, it becomes very, very important. But also why is social media important is that many people are increasingly relying on social media platform uh, for information. Uh, so the social, social media also gives us the opportunity to have dialogues, to have uh, uh, that are participatory in nature. But not only does this offer significant benefits, therefore to, to drive messages that are interactive between government and citizens, uh, citizens have come to expect that. So I think this is another critical point that you must take into account when you talk about social media platforms. Or perhaps you, you lost me when I was talking about uh, global governments, how, they were, how they've used the social media platforms to respond to crises. It has become a norm and an expectation. But uh, can, what is this, uh, why social media engagement is important in our South African context? Social media is important in our context in South Africa because if you look at the uh, a population of almost 60 million and we have a 64% internet penetration, that's the first point. The second point is that um, we have over 38 million people that are on the internet. Of those, uh, social media penetration is, stands at 49%. Uh, on the other hand, we, we have a, a, a mobile connection of 100 million. It means most of us have got more than one uh, uh, mobile device that we use to, inter uh, to connect to the internet. On the other hand, we have a, a serious uh, explosion of social media platforms. I mean, most of us are on, on Facebook, uh, on WhatsApp, on Instagram even on Twitter. So this gives you a captive audience in these platforms. If you look at how South Africans are using WhatsApp, uh, YouTube, even the youngsters uh, on, on, on TikTok and Snapchat, it demonstrates the fact that uh, as a country, we are a country that uh, constantly relies on social, on social media platform uh, to drive, uh, uh, to, to, to get information, access information, but also to drive that uh, information. But of course, social media comes with its own challenges that we have to take into account. And uh, some of those challenges pertains to citizen engagement uh, through government social media platforms. And the first point here is that social media uh, often is seen as a secondary platform, as a supplementary platform to drive communication. Secondly, is that uh, there is often a top-down approach when we talk to talk about the use of social media to engage citizens. In other words, we don't create a, a, an opportunity for citizens to co-create and drive the messages that, that they think are important in that context. And the third point is a point of the digital divide. The fact of the matter is that there are still areas in South Africa where there is no proper infrastructure to drive digital communication. On the other hand, we've got uh, the expensive or the exorbitant uh, prices uh, for data. Data is still very uh, expensive in our context. But most importantly, the point that I think Dr. Chris spoke about is the prevalence of disinformation and misinformation. Uh, I think also Tasnim spoke about infodemics. These are some of the challenges that must always bear in mind when we deal with the, how can we use social media to communicate a crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic. So what is to be done? Um, again, what we need to consider um, 
in South Africa, in our context, is that we have got high levels of uh, racialized and gendered inequality, what we call the crisis of social reproduction. There is a huge amount of people who still rely on the traditional forms of communication with the radio being a very part of their life on how they get information. Uh, quite a number of people still rely on television news to get uh, information. Therefore, this calls in my view, while I advocate for the use of social media to drive messages, I think we need to consider a, an integrated form of approach when we talk about uh, communicating of uh, the pandemic and all the rollout programs that pertains uh, to it. I'm making a case for the personal model that this is what we need to, uh, uh, as communicators, this is what we, we really need to take into account when we drive communication. So this model basically simply uh, acknowledges that we will have to, at some point in your life, when you communicate, you'd have to rely on the paid media, but you must also rely on the earned media and also on the shared media. The shared media is essentially the, uh, the social media platforms that you have, uh, I was demonstrating that South Africans, South Africans have got access to it. But most importantly, the owned media, what media does the, the government owns that it can use to drive its communication. Now, in the context of the paid media, I still think that there is a case that uh, traditional commercials and highly creative print uh, media, including social media adverts, sponsored content, uh, email marketing, and all those aspects still remain relevant for us to communicate all the, uh, the key information that we want to drive. On the other hand, the earned media is what government has relied on so far, uh, because the, whether, whether it's the president, whether it's the minister of health or the acting minister of health, uh, they rely on the media to drive those messages. Shared media, as, as I've defined above, uh, social media platforms is a major, should be the major focus to ensure that there is dialogue. Citizens are able to ask questions. All the questions that have been forwarded here, we should find a way of ensuring that we use social media to drive, uh, to drive those uh, messages and respond to the concerns of the citizens. I think that the own media is a backbone of where content is created, whether government colleagues use whatever platforms, social media, whatever platforms, it is where the content is created that must be shared, but it must be shared in a context where there is co-creation between government and citizens. If you look at the global, uh, one of the examples I want to use is the, the Canadian uh, rollout um, uh, using social media to drive COVID-19 messages. There was a single message across party political affiliations. And I think this is another approach that we can consider in South Africa. So if you look at the fact that most of the leaders of government are on social media, whether you, you look at the presidency uh, that a 1.9 million followers, uh, the, the minister, former minister of health, uh, huge number of followers on, uh, on, on, so on Twitter. GCIS, again, just right now, before I came to this, uh, to this meeting, the president was live on Facebook, I think it's somewhere in Tembisa. How do we ensure that we use these platforms to constantly coordinate a single message on, on, on the very uh, important question of COVID-19 and the vaccine rollout? For me, it becomes important. If you look at other ministers, government uh, and political leaders, they are on social media. For example, uh, the Minister of Transport, Figi Lembalu, has got 2.5 million followers. How do we ensure that we use uh, those uh, influ influencers on, on social media to drive these messages? Uh, the opposition party leaders, influential business people, celebrities and influencers, they are all on these platforms and with a serious number of following that we can uh, uh, develop a single themed message to ensure that we drive those messages. These are some of the ideas that I think we can take into account if we are to rely 
on social media to drive uh, our messages on COVID-19. Let me stop there, Chairperson. Uh, in the interest of time, I think I won't uh, touch on other points. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Pofra Um Right, so just so that the participants know, uh, we are going to take questions for uh, all the remaining speakers at the end. We, we only took Dr. Crisps because he had to leave early. Uh, so thank you very much for that insightful talk. Please, when you're typing questions into the Q&A, indicate who your question is for uh, so that I can direct them to the right person uh, at the end. Uh, okay, so uh, now I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Admiral Mare. Uh, Prof Mare is a, an Associate Professor and Deputy Head in the Department of Communication at the Namibia University of Science and Technology, Vintuk, Namibia. Uh, he's also a senior research associate at the University of Johannesburg's Faculty of Humanities. His research interests include the complex intersection between technology and society, digital journalism, social media and politics, media and democracy, media and conflict, and the role of artificial intelligence in newsrooms. Professor Mari currently leads the international research project Social Media, Misinformation and Elections in Kenya and Zimbabwe, funded by the Social Science Research Council. He is co-author of Participatory Journalism in Africa Digital News Engagement and User Agency in the South, uh, and co-editor of Media, Conflict and Peacebuilding in Africa, Empirical and Conceptual Considerations. Uh, Prof. Mari, are you available? I am available. Thanks a lot, Prof. Thanks a lot, Prof, for, for the introduction. I hope I, you, can, you can hear me loud and clear there. I can hear you now, thank you. I, I see you're in the Caribbean, wonderful, enjoy. Oh, <laughs> can you see, can you see my slides? <laughs> I like that. Yes, we can see your slides. Okay, let me try. It's a little small one. though. Please, please do make it into a, that, that's it. Great. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Thanks a lot for the introduction. I don't want to waste much of our time because I think uh, Prof. Rajabi has pretty much, uh, you know, I would say preempted my talk, but uh, nonetheless, I would try and uh, just uh, raise a few issues that I think are also uh, increasingly becoming important if we are to deal with uh, uh, the disinfodemic or what is called uh, a, a mix of misinformation and disinformation and also conspiracy theories that have also accompanied the spread of uh, COVID-19, uh, especially in Africa and even beyond. So let me just uh, start by um, just you know, highlighting what I what I intended actually to look at, but because of time, probably I'm going to jump a few slides. I just want to start by uh, looking at uh, these quotes, and I think these quotes are very instructive because, uh, in many ways, they give they, they give us you know uh, an entry point into understanding what is really happening. For example, when you look at uh, uh, you know Tedros' uh, remarks on the 15th of February, 2020, he argued that we are not just fighting an epidemic but we are fighting an infodemic. For, for, fake news spreads faster and more easily than the virus, it just is, uh, is, is just as dangerous uh, as the virus. And again, on the same note, again, uh, the, the, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, was also quoted uh, saying that the spread of the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic has also given rise to the second pandemic of misinformation uh, from harmful uh, health advice to wild conspiracy theories. So pretty much this is the context in which I am pitching this particular presentation, but I'll try to, 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 to be fast because we, I think I believe that there's more that we can actually get in dialoguing over these issues. Let me uh, just try and uh, my slides, yeah, okay. Uh, I, I would I would have wanted to 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 go deep and try and uh, and, 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 and 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 look at the the, 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 the the contextual issues and also try and look at uh, uh, the definitional issues around these particular issues. But I just want to say that in many ways the COVID nineteen has disrupted our world as we know it. Pretty much, I think in our in our current uh, epoch right now, is pretty much uh, COVID nineteen has been one of the major uh, disruptors uh, in the way how we organize our everyday life. And it has not only uh, disrupted the, our everyday life, but it has also disrupted the normal functioning of infrastructures of truth. And when we are talking about infrastructures of truth, I'm talking about newsrooms, the way newsrooms ought to operate, but also the way journalists also need to do their work in order to give us you know, factual and accurate information, but this has been disrupted in many ways. And I, I, I want to argue that uh, in, the, in the initial stages, actually, we saw a lot of uh, journalists actually working from home because it was very difficult for them to remain place uh, bound and actually operating within a newsroom context so that they could actually give us uh, truthful and accurate information. And that created an, an information 
uh, vacuum that I'm going to talk about that also uh, gave rise to conspiracy theories. It also gave rise to a, a whole lot of uh, disinformation that I also want to talk about. But also equally important to, to note is that while least that was also happening, we also saw a, a, a rapid rise in terms of the centralization of the you know, of communication uh, by most governments. So all of a sudden, we were pretty much taken back into the pre-digital space where the government pretty much became the communicators, the government uh, ministers, the heads of state and other you know, uh, uh, high, high, high level officials began to, to speak to us uh, through different kinds of mediums. And that centralization, ultimately created in a situation where you know, news management processes were pretty much uh, co controlled uh, from the top. And once you have that, you have what we call press release journalism. So journalists couldn't move out of their houses. So they relied on press releases that were coming from, uh, from, from, from politicians. And uh, again, that also created a situation that I want to talk about in this particular presentation. And I'll give ways uh, that we can actually try and uh, remedy the situation because these things can still be, be sorted out. But also the other thing that I just want to say that because we journalists were actually working from home or some of them were even not even uh, able to work uh, even uh, because of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, delays in the supply chain of the news with uh, truthful information created a situation in which everyone had to look up to politicians and scientists to give us answers. And in that kind of an environment, I would argue, uh, the, the problem is that we, we, we found ourselves in a situation where most people didn't know what was happening around them. They were just being told that they have to, to, be, to be locked down. But when you are locked in, looking, looking down the, the, the space, what, what would you explain to the ordinary person what is really happening, what justifies us to be in, in a lockdown situation? And I think that also created a situation where conspiracy theories ultimately uh, begin to, 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 to find an uh, easy and conducive uh, environment to, 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 to ferment. But also, I also argue that there was the initial phases, the early phases of this pandemic also created a situation where there was lack of scientific consensus. There was lack of consensus around what was happening, what was uh, the, 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 the cause of COVID-19. Was it coming from China? Was it, you know, there, there, were, there, were, there were a lot of things that were happening and that created again a situation where it became very difficult to push for effective public health communication because that context was pretty much characterized by so many scientific claims that were trying to explain what was happening. And unfortunately, in that kind of an environment where there's information vacuum, lack of consensus amongst scientists, Unfortunately, what you often find is that narratives that try to compete and to explain what is going on, who is responsible, how to fix it, ultimately take over. And ultimately, this is the space in which we find ourselves. Unfortunately, maybe fortunately, around probably pretty much around March 2020, we began to see a lot of information overload because all of a sudden the government got into the space and started pushing out a lot of information to the people to the point that people were pretty much got into a level where they were saying, no, there's a lot of information fatigue. We have gotten enough of COVID-19, please just give us other things. And, and again, that again created a situation where again, conspiracy entrepreneurs took advantage of the space to begin to push out again, uh, uh, you know, certain kinds of uh, narratives that were contrary to what the government was trying to, 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 to speak. I, I would want to argue that uh, unfortunately, or fortunately in Africa, Fake news, or whether we call it fake news, misinformation, disinformation, have always been part and parcel of our news ecosystem. It has always been there. But of course, digital media technologies like social media have allowed these things to be amplified to a higher level. But again, these things have always been there. And unfortunately, as I've already pointed out, in a context where there's information vacuum, or in a context where there's lack of consensus among scientists, they are, there is always a way in which ordinary people try to explain the world around them. So conspiracy theories in that kind of environment become a folder through which people try to explain the perils, the uncertainties of contemporary life. And it's very important for us to, to take these conspiracy theories seriously because in most cases, when we fail to explain what is happening, people always find opportunities in other spaces to try and explain what is happening around them. And in, in, that, in that regard, I would argue that conspiracy theories become sense-making uh, mechanisms that are used by ordinary people to try and explain the unpredictable and the risk nature of societies in which we find ourselves. And unfortunately, uh, this uh, creates a situation where it becomes very difficult. I would not, I would not want to spend much of our time talking about what we call uh, when we talk about information disorders, but I would just want to say, 
when we talk about information disorders, pretty much we are talking about a, combi a combination of misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. And these come in various forms, of course. When we talk about misinformation, obviously, you are talking about issues around false connection. Uh, we talk about misleading content. When you talk about disinformation, the, the main ingredients there is around false context, it's around imposter content, it's also manipulated context, but also there's also fabricated content. But when you also talk about malinformation, sometimes you're talking about leaks, you know, harassment, hate speech, that's pretty much what you often see uh, in, in, that, in, in that regard. But because of my time, I would want us to, to move a bit further so that I can then try and explain why we find ourselves in a space where we, we find ourselves. Uh, let me move on to another slide. And this one I've already has already again been talked about by, uh, by Prof. Radebe, so I don't want to, to waste much of your time because I think, uh, so in, in, many, in many instances, what has also happened is that COVID-19 came at a time when authoritative, you know, trust in authoritative sources like health and scientific institutions was pretty much declining. And again, all, all of a sudden, ordinary people had to find other alternative sources to try and explain what was happening, but also trust in science itself and scientists again was pretty, pretty much also on the, on the, on the one uh, during that time because also so many pseudo scientific exp explanations were coming to the fore, which created a situation where it became very difficult for ordinary people to understand really what was going around them. So we, we need to understand this one. And I think this contextual factors that I'm trying to, to, to paint here are very important for us to understand why we find ourselves in a, in a, in a, in a, in a climate surrounded by what I would call vaccine hesitance. It's because of the context in which we are operating. Again, because of time, maybe I just want to flag what, what, what are the key issues that drive people to push disinfodemic or conspiracy theories. Obviously, when, when in, a, in a society where there is a decline of trust in government institutions and experts, what, what you are likely to see is that conspiracy theories, misinformation and disinformation find a conducive environment. Again, in a space where there is a retreat of the development of state is manifesting in terms, in terms of erosion of social welfare and also other related issues, chances are that you often see that people often tend to other things to try and explain why is it that they are you know, dealing with the challenges that they, 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 are, they are dealing with. Again, in context where there's a lot of income inequality, recession and austerity, these again create conditions where people can try to find other platforms to try and understand the shadow forces that are at the work at, at work, which are making their lives very difficult. So pretty much you, you you'd expect in this kind of an environment a lot of conspiracy theories, a lot of misinformation, a lot of disinformation. But also very important is also that in a con in a context where there is a lot of conspiracy uh, populism, or you also likely to see again a lot of uh, a lot of uh, conspiracy theories, but also going to see a lot of misinformation. Again, the issue of ethno-nationalism, but I'm not going to speak about it. Maybe I'll, I'll explain it when, I, I, when, 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 when I'm doing answer, answer, uh, question and answer segment. But I just want to say that, as, uh, as uh, Prof. Uh, Radebe has pointed out, the other context which also makes it very difficult to deal with conspiracy theories is that social media companies are based on what we call surveillance capitalism. That's the business model that they use. So this business model is pretty much very easy. It's about making a lot of money through, you know, getting as many clicks, as many viewers and users on these platforms, the more you click, the more you link, the more you share, the more they get a lot of money. So for them, conspiracy theories by their nature, because they often uh, try to, 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 to push uh, for narratives around emotions, around issues that can push you know, people to, to act on in particular ways, they are likely to, to draw a lot of uh, clicks and a lot of uh, uh, shares. So obviously they are not going to de-platform that kind of, kind of content. And when you don't de-platform that kind of content, it means you are keeping your people or you are keeping the users coming back to your platform. And this is the, the tragedy that we find ourselves in, that we are living in a, in a world where we have got giant tech companies that have allowed this surveillance capitalism to be of more importance than actually saving lives. And I think that's where we we really need to look at and see what can really be done to make sure that we undo and unbundle these kinds of companies so that they can allow uh, 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 a normal kind of a public sphere to, to exist. Because of time, let me move. But I just want to flag maybe, the, again, related to conspiracy theories that 
we will need not to see conspiracy theories essentially is, is, is something that is negative. Yes, they are very negative because they can have real life serving consequences. But as I've already argued earlier, we need not to see these as delusional rantings of, of the French uh, elements in society, but we need to begin to see them as many people's normal way of thinking about who they are and how the world works. It's about how do we explain what is happening around us? And I think conspiracy theories in this regard become a mechanism through which we can understand human behavior and understand how people make sense of things that happen in their lives. And rather than just to, to try and, because the more we, we say, you know, we, we need to, to, we need to, to debunk these conspiracy theories, we, we, we fall, fall prey of actually failing to understand human beings because human, be, human behavior by its very nature is very complicated. And the other issue that I just want to say is that, again, conspiracy theories oftentimes reflect a general skepticism of governmental authority, covert actions, and even official versions of the causes, prevention, and prognosis of uh, the COVID-19. They also express a philosophical anxiety about agents and causality, especially in crisis times. So it's very important for us to begin to understand and to appreciate conspiracy theories is a way of trying to have an alternative interpretation of events around uh, uh, happening around uh, people's lives. You know, and, and the more we do that, the more we begin to understand how people can actually be, be reached out with information that can change their, 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 their lives. And again, the other issue that I also want to say is that usually, unlike misinformation and disinformation, conspiracy theories are not usually as a result of lacking of, of information or even fault information. In fact, they are an expression of a deeply held view that is tied to a person's sense of identity. So for example, from a religious point of view. So if we are going to be able to debunk conspiracy theories from a religious point of view, we need to understand why people believe the world operates the way it, it operates. Or from an ethnic or a cultural or a political viewpoint, how, do, how does the world operate? And the more we, we, we understand that this is a world view and unlike disinformation and misinformation, as I've already pointed out, conspiracy theories oftentimes deal with people's uh, senses of identity. And once you deal with people's identity, it becomes very difficult to just use simple behavioral change techniques to, 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 to change people's behavior. You need much more uh, so that you can be able to, to, to debunk and deal with conspiracy theories. Because of time, I think my time is really up. I just want to, up, um, to, 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 to push a bit and go to, these are some of the, the main conspiracy theories I think you still know. Uh, the first one that you know of, obviously, is that COVID, one that conspiracy theory that was being pushed around was that COVID-19 is a Chinese or an American produced bioweapon. COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic was orchestrated by Bill Gates as a pretext to vaccinate and track global populations. COVID-19 is part of a global government plot to take away our civil, rights, civil liberties. Uh, COVID-19 was developed in a labor in laboratory in Wuhan, which was also a manufacturing uh, a, a drug popular among uh, the global elite. You know, again, COVID-19 is actually caused by 5G and is a pretext for genocide uh, by vaccine. Again, these are some of the, but for, for us to understand why people believe in these kinds of things, we need to understand their identities, their sense of identities, and how they create and you know, you know, you know, perform their identities. And it's very important that even in our messaging, we begin to unpack these things within the context of people's identities, rather than to think to think that people are just playing, uh, becoming difficult in terms of understanding what is happening around COVID-19. So what I what what do I what do I suggest? What needs to be done? As I've already pointed out, obviously, behavioral change needs to, to happen and there should be behavioral shifts. But as I've already pointed out, it's, it's complicated to change people's minds, especially when it concerns their identities. So in that regard, for example, if you are dealing with the religious uh, leaders, we need to use the religious leaders as entry points. We need to, to, to incorporate them as our communicators. They should be our influencers within their own spaces so that they can begin to speak messages that resonates with the people. Otherwise, if, as long as the religious leaders speak something that is contrary to what is being spoken by scientists, chances are that we are there, there's, there's a clash of, of, of knowledge is there. There's also a clash of worldviews there. It makes it very difficult for us to have a vaccine uh, a uptake. And then the other issue that I just want to flag because I think time is up again, is that you know social media companies must up their game in terms of platforming, deplatforming uh, individuals, groups and problematic content. Because of course, as we have already pointed out, this can lead to real life, uh, uh, life-threatening uh, consequences, of course, but in as much as deplatforming is pretty much beginning, increasingly becoming a very important, uh, important uh, mechanism. One thing that we also need to show, to know is that uh, 
de-platforming on its own does not change conspiracy people that are actually producing this conspiracy. So again, we also need to find ways of you know in, 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 entering into the into the realm through which uh, these conspiracy uh, entrepreneurs exist, so that we can be able to to change their ways uh, of of seeing the world. But also the other thing is that there's need to rebuild trust rather than just merely uh, asserting authority. So communication should be about building trust, rebuilding trust. In, in, in science, rebuilding trust in, 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 in governments, but also rebuilding trust in, in, in the way in which journalism also pro, uh, you know, operates so that can, people can begin to, to take it seriously. And then there's another thing that I also feel is also very important, that there's also need to understand why some people feel so disen, disen, disenfranchised and also disillusioned so that they tend to this conspiracy theory. So as I've already pointed out, most of the time people go to conspiracy theories because they feel distanced from, they are, they are so distanced uh, from the, 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 the government. They feel like they, they don't belong. And as long as they feel like that, there is chances that they may not take uh, the message that comes from uh, a centralized government communication seriously because they have got a mistrust already within the government and that can also create uh, serious. And, and then what are the recommendations? Let me just run through these uh, recommendations in a minute or two. I, say, I argue that uh, the government of South Africa must rely on local trusted opinion leaders uh, to, to, to communicate, especially the COVID message. And here I'm talking about religious, political, but also other cultural you know, leaders that are often seen in, 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 by, 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 by different societies, by different communities as, uh, as a reference point. And also argue that South Africa must need to must also need to learn from uh, Sierra Leone, especially with the fight against Ebola. When Ebola came, uh, in, in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and also Liberia, what they did was they re relied essentially in, in, in a lot of times uh, on the role of traditional leaders, religious and cultural, uh, in dispelling the myths and misconceptions around the causes and also the vaccination uh, program that was going. But also we need to ramp up efforts to involve community media, as, as already uh, this has already been mentioned, but also we need to make sure that we break into the echo chambers because essentially where the misinformation and disinformation is actually playing itself out. It's in WhatsApp family groups, it's in WhatsApp uh, uh, religious groups, it's in WhatsApp uh, you know, community neighborhood groups. This is pretty much clubhouse rooms and all these other things. These are the spaces in which we are seeing conspiracy theories, disinformation and misinformation are continuously uh, evolving. And I think the more we, we, we need to, fo to, to, push, to push, we need to push to make sure that we break into the echo chambers. Otherwise, our, 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 our fight would remain uh, in vain. And then the other issues to say that we also need to refresh our, our messaging in order to avoid information and message fatigue. As I've already pointed out, there's been too much information that has been pushed out. But I think we need to start taking advantage of other popular means of communicating. For example, taking advantage of a, a popular meme that is going around and try to, to capture it and put a, an insert a, a COVID-related or a vaccine-related message there. Or you can take advantage of jokes that are circulating, or you can take advantage of cartoons. These are very popular ways in, of communicating amongst Africans. And the more you take advantage of them, the more chances that you may be able to communicate to people that uh, often do not listen to the traditional uh, media. So in, in a nutshell, let me just uh, conclude by saying that other tactics that have worked in the past are like uh, fear and scare tactics. Of course, during the HIV and AIDS, we saw a lot of fear and scare tactics that were used, which could actually be used in the short to medium term to just induce people to actually take a vaccine. But the other issue that we also just need to, to, to know is that, of course, the social media influencers are pretty much also very important, especially, especially when it comes to reaching the youth and especially those that are also uh, inter internet, connected with the internet. But the other issue that I also just want to say is that, again, more than ever, we also need to use a lot of local languages. We need to begin to use our own local languages to, to explain what COVID-19 is in our own local languages. Because the big words that often come with scientific, uh, scientific uh, terms is that they are very difficult for the ordinary person to be able to break and, uh, and unpack. And our communication must begin to start looking at how do we introduce our own local vernacular terms that can speak to, 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 our, to our context. And then finally, I argue that older people and people, especially in media poor environments, often lack the resources and literary skills to spot fake news. So we also need to begin to see what can we do to break into this, uh, into, the, into, into their spaces, because as long as they are, they are, they are disconnected, but still we have got access through maybe uh, you know, through through people that they interact with, they are likely to end up also becoming victims of this uh, uh, conspiracy and also disinformation uh, campaigns. And I think with that, let me end there. Thank you so much. Uh,
Prof. Smart for the opportunity and I, I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Murray, for those uh, very useful insights. Just a reminder, we are going to have a question session after uh, our next speaker. Uh, some real challenges there, Prof. Murray, particularly given how uh, we see in South Africa, at least, um, influential people working against us. Uh, you know, one politician here was describing the, the vaccines from the West as poisonous, organizing large marches, uh, you know, in favor of countries' vaccines whose economic policies are, are more favorable to, to theirs. So uh, some real challenges there for us, I think. Uh, just a reminder, please type your uh, uh, questions into the Q&A tab and indicate uh, to whom you'd like the question to be asked. Um, but now it's time to move on to our next speaker. Um, Zleba Fang Mulaisi is the Labour Market Policy Coordinator at the Congress of South African Trade Unions, uh, KASATU, uh, which, where, she, where she coordinates the implementation of the Federation's Labour Market Policy. She is an EXCO and MANCO member at the National Economic Development and Labour Council and represents organised labour in the Labour Market Chamber of NEDLAC. She serves as a steering committee member for the Presidential Health Compact and chairs Pillar 1 of the Compact Human Resources for Health. Ms. Laisi holds a Bachelor of Commerce Honours Degree in Economics and a Master of Commerce Degree in Developmental Economics. Uh, thanks, uh, Prof. Ben Smart. Now that you've read my bio, I feel like an underachiever um, with all the previous accolades that I'm now following, professors and doctors, um, but that's on a lighter note. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to do this presentation. So unlike the esteemed panelists ahead of me who've been talking about you know, the technicalities of social media, um, its benefits, its pitfalls, or whatever the case may be, I'll be talking more about you know, the social aspects uh, and just to appreciate you know, the, the insights and the views of the previous speakers. They've made my job very easy um, because I don't have to go into the background of it all. I think they've, they've perfectly categorized you know, the importance and the need um, for social media. All I have to do really is talk about some of the social development aspects um, that pertain to social media and how we can just bring everybody along when it comes to the issue of uh, media usage. Maybe let me start with you know, the points that uh, Ms. Tazneem uh, raised in her input, um, highlighting the fact that, you know, that social media is an important tool and we see that in today's um, society. We have information at our fingertips and we're able to communicate with just about anybody, no matter where we are in the world. And, and that's an important tool. If you look at the COVID pandemic and you've seen how it's physically divided us and we've not been able to interact with one another, I can have this presentation and I can do it in the comfort of my own home, as opposed to what we would have probably done if there was no pandemic would be together in a in a, in a boardroom somewhere and doing this particular engagement. So it's been very beneficial um, in that regard. And I think the previous panelists have characterized um, the issues pertaining to, you know, what are the disadvantages of having readily available information and such um, increased levels of connectivity amongst individuals and, and how that can be used very well and for productive uh, means and how it may necessarily not be used so very well. And we've seen that in the various um, misinformation campaigns and um, fake news or whatever the case may be. Um, but maybe what, I, what I'm tasked to talk about is more about, you know, what, what are the gaps? Um, who do we potentially exclude from reach if we have this over focused, you know, position on wanting to expand information and communication through social media? The truth is that given the advantages and, and given you know, the ease, the reach and whatever the case may be, the truth in South Africa is that we only have a 49% of, 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 of social media um, penetration. The, the truth of the matter is that in South Africa, given the prehistoric structural challenges of poverty, unemployment and inequality, the truth of the matter is that we have a significant digital divide, all right? It's, in fact, I think we can go as far as saying that it's not just a digital divide, it's digital inequality. Now, I, and I've, I've seen in the presentations that came before us, 
I think we all recognize the fact that, you know, we, we have this digital divide within society and we have this digital inequality and, and inequality in whatever, in whatever format it plays itself in, but there's just this hectic amount of inequality that we have in this country. I mean, we're the most inequal, inequal country in the world. But we talk about inequality as though it's this abstract con uh, concept. Um, and, and what I mean is like, we talk about it as though it's there, but it's not there. You know, it affects us, but it doesn't affect us. Um, and I think we need to be a bit more, we need to be more purposeful in dealing with this issue of, of inequality because the truth is, even though we do have a significant amount of people that are able to access social media, the truth is that we stand a huge potential of leaving the majority of the population behind if the emphasis is on how do we target those who are on social media and how do we drive mass communication, uh, particularly uh, if we have to look at this COVID um, pandemic, if we're going to drive it um, primarily through social media, we stand a chance of losing a lot of people if we don't look at a manner in which to transform the way in which you know, social media is currently being accessed in the South African context. So maybe let's talk about, you know, this issue of this digital divide and digital inequality in order to understand, you know, the gaps that currently exist. The truth of the matter is accessing social media is a costly exercise, right? Um, you need to have a device that's compatible with um, these social media applications. You need to have the enabling infrastructure where you are ge geographically lo located and you have to have access to internet. And it's so funny that when we need data the most, the calls for data to come down or data to fall have been the most silent. When we need data and we need the cost of data to be reduced because now more than ever, we're making use of data quite a bit to do our everyday lives. If you think about it, I mean, just to meet people is data intensive, just to communicate is data intensive, just to have platforms of this nature when we can talk and have, these types of webinars, this is a data intensive process. And now that we need data all the more, and I mean, if you look at the performance of these um, data companies and how they've just outperformed most industries, it just shows you that now more than ever, we are so data intensive and making use of so much data. And our calls for data to fall have sort of also fallen in the process. So we might want to pick up those campaigns to make sure that we can bring a lot more people along with us um, so that we're able to communicate um, quite significantly to those people who need the information the most, but over and above that we leave nobody behind. I think that needs to be you know, the, the, the aim, especially if we're talking about you know, the, the, the arm of government that's, that's, that's dealing with this issue of communicating and communicating to um, the communities at large. Now, you look at that issue of you know, not having that, you're not having those, 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 those tools of communicating on social media. And if we juxtapose that to the current context of South Africans who have limited, to, limited access to water, um, sanitation and electricity. So with that current with that current context, we 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 kind of now see you know how deep you know the 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 digital divide and digital inequality is um, between us. But not all is lost. I think we can take important lessons from you know this current era that we find ourselves in, and we can find ways in which to bridge this digital divide. And it's not impossible. Um, when we look at the Brazil example. Brazil, when they were trying to reach, um, they were trying to reach, you know, um, marginalized communities and bring um, information to them. Uh, they did this in the Amazonia region, uh, where they were trying to 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 reach those communities and 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 get better communication to those um, communities. I mean, if you think about just the word Amazonia region. All I think about in that region must be full of swamps and, you know, dense trees and forest. And that's exactly what the Amazonia region is. But because the Brazilian government was so determined to enhance communication and communication through social media, they call it the Info Center project. Because they were so committed to do this, they erected infrastructure in those areas where it's dense forest and it's filled with you know, swamp and water. But what they were able to do because they were so committed to making use of this tool of social media to not only just communicate 
but to provide, you know, information technology to schools so that schools could be able to access, you know, internet schools could be able to access tutorials from world-class teachers. They were able to do this info center project and provide, you know, those types of resources to places where you could not necessarily reach them if you wanted to go there. So it becomes very important for us to be very purposeful about how we want to reach communities. And if we are serious about reaching communities, how do we equip them with the skills to be able to make use of social media? And I think this is something that government really needs to think about. The economic reconstruction processes that are looking at infrastructural development need to prioritize issues, especially pertaining to ICT, if we want to bridge the digital um, divide. We need to look at how do we go into the rural communities of, 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 of Benda, Limpopo, KwaZulu Natal, the Eastern Cape, how do we start to providing the necessary infrastructure to make sure that those communities were able to bridge the digital um, divide? This is imperative, especially when we're living in this society and we're living in this moment where it is important for us to bridge um, this, digital this digital divide. I think we realize now more than ever that access to internet is going to be second most to access to water and electricity. And this becomes important. And if we really want to make use of this tool, which is, which is of social media, to get to people and to give them the information in order to empower them to deal with some of these issues, you know, that the professors and the previous um, um, speakers have highlighted before, you know, me doing this presentation, we need to think about bridging that divide and, and it's imperative and we kind of need to do it now. Now in the, in the, in the immediate term, I think what becomes very important, especially when it comes to communication on, 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 on issues pertaining to the pandemic, as well as vaccination, your best bet is traditional you know, the traditional mediums for communication. And, and I think uh, we need to acknowledge the role that, the, that you know, the GCIS um, and government has played in getting information throughout, especially through pl platforms like the SABC, as well as some of their radio um, platforms. It's really been commendable how, you know, on a daily basis, we've been able to see constant communication when it comes to this pandemic. We know on a daily basis what the level of cases have been. And I, I see now also the information pertaining to vaccines is now starting to be, you know, shared on a daily basis. On this issue of vaccine hesitancy, I think you know what we can really start to do, and we can do this through again traditional means of communication while we upskill our ability to be able to communicate at large um, with the general public through social media. What needs to be done at, at the level of you know the, the communicators and the GCIS is, you know, because this, this pandemic is a medical pandemic. Uh, and medical issues are always technical, that you can't run away from, you know, some of those technical terms. But in our communication of highly technical terms, how do we bring them down to the population so that they can be able to understand them in the most layman's of terms? So for example, what is vaccine hesitancy? If I have to explain to my grandmother, what is vaccine hesitancy? And what is vaccine hesitancy in my language? And why is it that what she is doing by not wanting to get a vaccine um, translating into vaccine hesitancy? So I think it's very important for us to, in the various languages, communicate these highly technical terms into layman's terms that people can easily understand and talk about. And I've seen the pre press briefings, and I think somebody who does this very well, um, Dr. Nkosa Zanatlamini Zuma, Every time she does a press briefing and she speaks about, you know, these issues pertaining to the pandemic, she's able to talk about highly technical terms, medical terms in English, and almost immediately after she's spoken about them in English, translate them into her native Zulu language and speak about them, not in a way that actually waters down what the term is, but explaining it almost exactly as how she was talking about it when it was in English. So here it's not to dumb down the information, but to translate it in a manner in which still communicates the message as effectively as you would have if you were speaking to an English audience. I think this becomes very 
very important. You know, I listened to the good doctor, Nicholas Crisp, and to be quite honest, I've worked with Dr. Crisp, you know, whether it be through the national health insurance work that we've been doing with the Department of Health, or whether it be through some of this vaccination work um, in the JSOC. And, you know, I sometimes listen to the terms Delta variant, beta variant. What is that? What, 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 what is that even in layman's terms and in our own language? How do we best explain this to a 60 and above audience who needs to go and get the vaccine quite, quite immediately? And because it, it, it's only in their best interest to get it and it's in the national interest for them to also receive it. So it becomes very important for us to discuss these pertinent pandemic sort of jargon but to translate it in a way that, you know, anybody who in, in layman's terms and in their own language can consume the information um, that we are receiving. Now, I know um, there's, I know that, you know, we're, we're talking about communication and, and we're just talking about the various mediums in which to communicate. But it, but if we also look at the way in which general health provision takes place, you know, how we provide health care in South Africa. You know, I think the hesitancy would be significantly decreased if people had if people had had some sort of hope or had some sort of trust in our health sector. So for example, if I don't have a good experience in public health um, when I was making use of it for whatever the reason may be, chances are I'll be hesitant to go back to them for a vaccine. So just the way in which health, health provision happens in this, in this country is a good communicator for people to make use of health, even if it is for a vaccine. So we need to ensure that we improve, even through this vaccination drive, we improve the way in which we deliver services at the level of, uh, of, 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 of health, at the health department or public health for that matter. Because if I don't have a good experience going to a public health facility to access something else, chances are I'm not gonna come back even if it is for a life-saving vaccine because I haven't had a good experience when I was making use of public health in previous you know, circumstances. So being able to provide good quality access to healthcare becomes another good communicator for people to also um, receive um, vaccines. Maybe in conclusion, because most of the points that I, I was wanting to make, um, the, the previous panelists have already started to, uh, or, or already in detail spoken to, and I've, I've, I've gained a lot from their presentations. Um, you know, the, the way in which we improve, uh, you know, the vaccine drive, and I know fear is probably one of the ways to, to go about it, but... <laughs> I, I would I would advocate that we don't you know we don't bully and 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 and, and group people with fear for them to make use of a vaccine. I think the best way to encourage people to get a vaccine is not necessarily through fear, but it's actually through transparency. If we can be as transparent as possible with the population about what are the pitfalls, what are the risks, what are the advantages, or whatever the case may be. That is how we encourage people to acquire a vaccine. If government is, is, is clear and is transparent and sometimes transparent about some of the challenges that they're having within the vaccine rollout. And by the way, they've done a very good job considering where we started and where we are today and, and about 10% of the population being vaccinated. Government has really done a real good job when it comes to this. And, and we really need to communicate this with the general public because that also encourages the, the public to come and receive a vaccine because now they have general trust um, of, of, of government and the government to deliver a particular service. Um, but we, we, we encourage people, we encourage people to, to come forth and get a vaccine when we are transparent with the population. If things are not going right, let's say so. If things are going well, let's also say so, because I think that to a great extent encourages people to come forth and get a vaccine. And maybe just like in the last thing that I, I wanted to say, you know, it's, it's very important. And I, I know the media has been very good in getting the, the information that, to the public. Um, and and that's, that's been very, very good. And I think to a certain extent, you guys keep government on their toes and that's good. We need a government that can deliver and sometimes the media helps us in order to, to achieve that objective. But let's also 
mention when things are going right. Let's also say something when things are going good. 10% of the population being vaccinated in the amount of time that it's taken is a huge achievement. Let's communicate that. Let's encourage people to get um, vaccinated. And I think that's how we win the war when it comes to this pandemic. The science is complicated. It's even complicated at, at the level of, of the JSOC. The science is, 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 is ever changing. The science is evolving. Um, but as and when it evolves, let's come to the people, let's be as transparent as, as, as possible and communicate these facts um, with the general public. And I think in, in, in us encouraging transparency, that's how we win um, the war. And this is how we communicate effectively with, with the population. I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and then we'll have more time for, 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 for questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Malema Hang. I really appreciate that. Very interesting talk. Um, I think. Uh, let's move swiftly on to uh, the questions. I noticed that a number of questions have been answered uh, in the Q&A chat box. Uh, so you are welcome to um, read the responses. Uh, however, I'm going to give the speakers an opportunity to answer uh, in person as well, even if they have responded um, to the question. Okay, uh, Prof Radere, uh, with so much fake news on social media, how do we help people make a distinction? Yeah, thank you, Ben, for, for that question. I, I think the starting point uh, is to rely on official uh, sources uh, as a basis upon which we, we identify and we distinguish what is fake and what is uh, real. So every time you come across the, I mean, I, I've seen a lot of uh, people simply forwarding uh, messages that comes to them without verifying that information. I think it is important to, to rely on official sources. I know the, the downside of that is that obviously you, you tend to rely on official voices and uh, diminish the voice of the of the ordinary people, the working class. But I think in the context of uh, dealing with fake news, I think that's, that's for me is a, is a primary uh, focus. Obviously, when you, look at, when you look at the problem of fake news or misinformation and disinformation, from a technical point of view, I think that one of the things we need to imagine is how do we use the technology, artificial intelligence, to begin to counter the spread of uh, fake news uh, that is driven by uh, conspiracy theorists, uh, the bots on the internet. Um, but as a starting point, what, what we do now is that everyone must honestly rely on information, uh, on official sources um, to, to understand the challenges uh, of fake news. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Prof Mare. Um, the 35 plus cohort was characterized by enthusiasm to vaccinate and we saw that in the numbers. I'm afraid that the upcoming 18 plus cohort has already begun to spread anti-vaccine messages in the pursuit of likes and followers. How do you think we should approach this in the short term? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, let me just uh, try and answer that particular question. I think at least the, the advantage of the 18 plus cohort is that at least most of them either they are at school, or they are pretty much most of them are still in the school going age or pretty much a college or probably at university. So at least we need to target, of course, as I've pointed that we need to have uh, information champions. For example, let's have teachers, let's have uh, lecturers, and also let's have uh, let's have social media influencers that we use uh, as part of uh, 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 the, the arsenal that we can put in this toolkit so that we can actually drive you know cohesive message, but also consistent, accurate, and also truthful message to these people. Because unfortunately. What we are, what we, what what we see, especially in the in, in this converged kind of ecosystem where we are, is that people have got access to a wide range of you know information from other sources. But there are certain people that when they speak into their lives, uh, these kinds of uh, these people, especially eighteen to fifteen, they can listen to. So of course, social media influencers are some of them are uh, pretty much maybe they are lecturers and teachers, but also maybe if they are still within religious community groups, again, pastors are uh, you know you know priests and other you know you know and other related uh, people can actually also be used uh, as, as, as conduits through which we can actually push this kind of message uh, to this kind of group. That's what I would say. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one is to any of the presenters. Um, 
Could the statistics about accessing and actively participating in digital platforms be tallying with the country's literacy levels? Assuming that's the case, this suggests that we need to also identify user-friendly platforms that recognize and appreciate our literacy levels to reach out to all. Uh, government needs to invest in community media and not use it as an alternative when there is no budget to buy space in the mainstream media. Perhaps uh, Ms. Leberhang, uh, Malaisi might have something to say about that. Yes, um, so the comment is, 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 is quite right. Some of these platforms are complicated to make use of even for, you know, I'm under 35, so I should be able to make use of many applications, but, but they're complicated. Um, and, you know, compounded with the issue of, you know, literacy level, that, that's, that's quite correct. Um, these are the issues that could, that could complicate, you know, some of the issues pertaining to access to um, social media. So I don't know if, if, if the, the, the author of, of the comment is, is saying that, you know, government needs to look into creating its own application. And there probably there are a few um, applications that are circulating um, on these app stores that you know government is probably um, making use of to be able to communicate but but definitely um if it's it serves the purpose of trying to boost this issue of access to social media platforms i definitely think that it's 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 really um the the way to go because what you want to do especially if you're a government and you're trying to communicate with people as much as possible through these various platforms user friendly is definitely the way to go and if that also corresponds to you know the issue of literacy levels that's probably what government should probably consider um, making use of this could be through the establishing or, or creating your own applications with that, which I think GCIS is already um, probably seized with, but definitely it's, 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 it's the way um, to go for us. If you're, we're suggesting that we should create additional social media platforms, I think that's a bit more complex, but I definitely think that this is a space for government to intervene in, to create um, applications of their own um, so that we're able to communicate much easier um, with the South African audience, especially when it comes to, you know, issues pertaining to the current pandemic. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to weigh in on that? Yes, if I can, if I can come in, I think the, uh, the numbers uh, demonstrate to us that there's a, there's a quite a number of South Africans who are on, on the internet and therefore on social media. But also there's quite a number of South Africans who still rely on the traditional forms of media as a source of information. Radio is very important, remains very important for, for people who live, the working class and people who live in rural uh, areas. Uh, quite a number of um, urbanite uh, people still rely on uh, television as a source of information. It is therefore important that we consider an integrated approach uh, so that we do not leave anyone behind. But fundamentally, my point is that on social media, it, it, it must be, because what is, so, so what, what is social media doing is it is democratizing the, co the communication platforms at our disposal. So it is therefore important that we just do not perceive it as a top-down approach where we simply dump information and leave it there. It becomes imperative that we interact and engage with people with a view to co-create uh, to listen to citizens is a, is a critical aspect uh, of uh, democracy. So that for me uh, becomes important. Of course, the, the fact of the matter is that South Africa is a racialized, um, we've got a, a, a highly racialized inequality. Um, and, and therefore that will interpret itself in a manner in which uh, people have got access to mobile phones, the internet and so on and so forth. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I, I think we're finding, um a lot of the, uh, the social media content becomes politicized in a, in a pandemic when it's no place for a politicization of, of content. And yet that does seem to happen. Um, and this actually uh, is, remains relevant to the, to the following question, again, for uh, Prof Radebe. Um, Fake news and subjectivity impact and dilutes government's efforts to communicate messages aimed at engaging citizens. With the huge followers of President Ramaphosa, Minister Malula, etc., the Prof cited as key in disseminating messages for government are those who follow to undermine efforts to engage South Africans. We also have fake accounts and bots created to mislead people and divert attention. How do we balance being proactive 
with reacting without sounding defensive. Precisely the point I was making earlier on that um, for me, there are two aspects to this question. The first one is that if you look at the PESO model I was talking about, is that the content emanates from what I call the owned media and it therefore migrates to what is called the shared space. And, and, and I want to argue and encourage government communicators to ensure that there is coordination. Uh, so what the presidency says on the online platforms, uh, you need to ensure that you get a buy-in from all of those who are around the president, whether it's ministers, whether it's uh, people that are on oversight in parliament, whether it's po other political parties, other it's business people uh, to ensure what uh, Professor Mario was talking about, to ensure that there is coordination that is important to reinforce correct information because if information comes from official sources, it is likely to be believed. But of course, on the technical side, I think that uh, there is a lot of work that needs to be done to combat uh, disinformation on the internet, uh, including using technology to do that. But one way I think we need to consider also is regulation because uh, as things stand, these platforms are unregulated. Therefore the owners, the capitalist uh, owners of these platforms are not held accountable for the content that is uh, perpetuated and spread uh, on their platform. So we need to consider all, all, all these things. Uh, thank you very much. I, I know that there are a couple of hands, um, but uh, the, the way we run the question sessions, you have to type your question into the, into the question box. So if, you, if you've raised a hand, please rather type uh, the question out. Um, I'm going to ask a question now that, that um, will hopefully try and consolidate uh, a number of questions. Um, so we have highly influential uh, people, uh, some politicians, uh, some, you know, uh, just uh, uh, pop culture uh, influences and so on and on social media um, that actively set out to um, spread disinformation. Right, uh, th th these are people that have huge followings, you know, millions and millions of, 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 of followers uh, and do so in public spaces and, have, and organize large gatherings with thousands of people uh, spreading misinformation and disinformation, um, holding group gatherings where, where they're banned by law, you know, es essentially uh, breaking COVID regulations. Um, now, you know, there, there, there are two questions um, that come to mind. Uh, one really pertains to social media and the other pertains more to um, policing, I suppose, right? We've noticed that SAPs have done nothing, right? The EFF held a big march, nobody was arrested. There was everything that went on in Candler, nobody was arrested. SAPs just stand by and let these uh, thousands of people gather, right, uh, with, without anything happening. The same thing happens on social media. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing these same politicians and these same people um, saying that, the, the Pfizer vaccine, all the ones from the West are poisonous, you know, uh, and, and yet there's no uh, consequences for these actions. So the question I have is uh, how should, if anything, um, one deal with this uh, without compromising freedom of speech, but at the same time protecting the South African people from what's essentially exceptionally dangerous and entirely self-interested behavior in the search for political relevance? And um, this is a question for, for anyone to answer. Okay, let, let, let me start. And I know I can see Prof. Murray is nodding, so he's going to follow in Lebuchang. <laughs> we'll also follow. I think, I, I think the first part is that the law enforcement must do their, must do their, do their work. If uh, I, I go outside without wearing a mask, uh, I should be held accountable for that. Uh, because we cannot afford to be a country that descends into lawlessness. So uh, we can talk about the challenges uh, around that. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with it. But I think the bottom line is that people who, who break the COVID-19 regulations must be held accountable. Now coming to, 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 to social media, and, and those are some of the limitations in my view of lack of regulation, because you know that if the, a print media publication or a radio station or a television for that matter broadcasts a, a, a misleading a story, 
they know that they can be held accountable. And at some point we've seen so many people uh, apologizing for misleading headlines uh, or for misleading stories. The challenge with social media is that you've got all these people known uh, influencers on social media saying all manner of wrong things, but they cannot be held accountable precisely because of the lack of regulation on the platform. I think the, the owners of the platforms must be held accountable for the information that is found on their platforms. But secondly, the people who drive those messages must be held accountable. I mean, we saw quite a number of people, uh, uh, so and so we see you, basically encouraging looting and, and, and criminality and people are still walking free, you know? So I think it is important that uh, uh, on social media platforms, regulations becomes very important because that's when you can then hold uh, people uh, accountable. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Prof. Um, Prof Mare. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Prof Sumati. And also thanks a lot, Prof Redeb. I think you've uh, captured what I wanted to say, but I just want to emphasize that I think uh, issues to do with the rule of law and equality before law, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot argue about that. Everyone must be equal before law. If, if somebody has uh, transgressed against uh, COVID regulations, obviously the law must take its course. It's as simple as that. And then the issue of um, the issue of uh, platform companies or social media companies, I think certainly as uh, Prof. Radebi has pointed out, these must be regulated or if not regulated, they must be unbundled because they are too big. They are way too big, and unfortunately, because they are way too big, they've put profit at the expense of uh, saving lives. And unfortunately, as I pointed out in my presentation, their 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 content, uh, their content, the way how they, their algorithms work, they actually instead of actually uh, deplatforming uh, some of this content, they actually encourage it because it it, it attracts a lot of clicks, it attracts it attracts a lot of links, uh, and also shares. And unfortunately, this is the business model. So we need to disrupt the business model. Unfortunately, they are not there. Of course, they are not going to behave about it, but I think we need to disrupt that business model so that ultimately the people that are actually pushing this kind of thing realize that they don't have traction. They don't, they're not going to get a lot of clicks and likes or followers because of uh, uh, producing and circulating conspiracy theories or in affecting it. So I think certainly there we need to see a, a lot of action, uh, uh, especially in Africa. And unfortunately, we have seen what has happened in, in, in in Australia, where Australia, the, the Australians have said, no, no, these companies must share their, con their, their, their revenue that they are getting with, uh, with our own traditional media spaces. But here in Africa, we are very quiet about it. And I think, of course, maybe it's because we have got smaller economies compared to those uh, other guys. But at the end of the day, at the level of African Union, SADC, I think we can do something. We can have, you know, some kind of, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, consultations there and then push an agenda to say this come if this company wants to operate here they have to abide within a specific uh, legal framework that we've put in place and I think that's what we need to do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Mal Malaisi, do you have anything to add? Yes I do um, and it ties well with you know what the two professors have been talking about. The issue here is the lack of regulation and this is where government has to play its part uh, and I know government, the South African government, doesn't have a very good track record in insisting on regulations in the private sector in general. Um, but there needs to be greater regulation of this, you know, these particular platforms because you 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 are recognizing a serious danger um, and a potential for even more danger if we don't subject some of these platforms to um, greater regulation. I mean, one of the things that can some of the things that cannot be tolerated on these platforms, hate speech, as well as the incitement of violence. I think those are, those are non-negotiables and persons who do find themselves participating in these platforms and perpetuating such should be banned. I mean, if, if in, in America, um, when Facebook decided to ban Donald Trump's accounts and, and that happened easily, I don't understand what the problem is doing it here in South Africa. During the, the past two weeks, just looking at the social media feeds of very influential social media influencers who are encouraging looting and the destruction of property. One such person even going as far as saying that, you know, if anybody's interested in approaching or targeting the nearest Mercedes Benz, I'm there to join you. A heavy social media influencer who receives a lot of sponsorship and endorsements through their platform, being able to incite violence in that manner and nothing happens through banning of that 
that particular profile is a serious problem. And this is where government really needs to step up its, 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 its regulation when it comes to these platforms, because we've seen how dangerous and how fast the information spreads on social media. And if it goes unabated, uncontained, these events can plague themselves again in the not too distant future because those who were able to get away with it will know that nothing happens to them if they perpetuate such things. So if we don't, it, you know, the terms and conditions have to be clear and the policies have to be clear. When it comes to incitement of violence and hate speech, there has to be a zero tolerance approach when it comes to that, especially on these platforms. Yes, I mean, I think um, these, these platforms are trying, or, or at least um, putting up a veneer of trying uh, to, to target this. Uh, you can now, whenever you see something that incites violence on Twitter, you can very easily report it. Uh, and then I, I reported a number of tweets in the last few weeks, and then you get a, you get a, a, a notice back saying, yes, it breaks the regulations and, and you know, they might ban. I think Julius Malema's account was banned for like 12 hours or something. I mean, you know, it's hardly going to achieve much, but I, su I suppose it, it, it could act as a warning to, to Mr. Malema that, you know, if he's not careful, he might end up the next Trump. And given that Twitter is a massive platform for him, he doesn't want that. Um, so, but, but there, is a, there is an issue, isn't there, with uh, who becomes the arbiter of truth, right? I mean, if, if, if you're Twitter uh, and you're being told, right, now you are responsible for, uh, for what comes up on this site, and you get to decide, uh, you know, what stays and what goes. Then Twitter essentially becomes the arbiter of truth and freedom of speech. Uh, and and this is a, this is an issue because who's to say that the the capitalist owners, as, as we like to call them, of Twitter are are good at, at distinguishing between um, harmful and non-harmful tweets. Uh, and the model at the moment seems to be to allow Twitter users to to report. Uh, potentially harmful tweets, and then someone comes along and, and, and assesses whether or not it is. Uh, but, but there is a freedom of speech issue to, to look at here. Um, and, you know, although uh, obviously I'm hugely against anti-vax campaigners, uh, I, I think they're incredibly dangerous. I also, I'm also a strong believer in, in freedom of speech. And, and you know, the, they're in act, they should be allowed to, to um, to say the things that they believe, but at the same time, it must be combated with the accurate information. Uh, but, but we do, we have a battle between uh, freedom of speech and, and regulating harmful content. Uh, it's, a, it's, a difficult, uh, it's a difficult issue. Um, okay, moving on, another question for uh, Ms. Malaisi. Uh, um, how can government, <laughs> it's a tricky one, how can government improve its outreach campaign on COVID-19 matters to reach far-flung areas where technology such as so social media is not so dominant? Yeah, so it's it's some of the things that we we were already starting to, 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 to talk about. Um, in some way or another, we do interact with our people in some way, form, or shape. It's either when they come to the health facilities, we can communicate with them there. Um, when they come out of their houses for to come and shop, we can interact with them there. So there's a number of ways that you know we can reach communities. Um, you know, I think even uh, Prof Khadev has been talking about the issue of the importance of traditional media, um, radio, television. Those becomes very important when we we are not necessarily able to drive the message um, through social media. But definitely, this issue of you know outreach it, it, it's very important at the Sasa pay points. That is a key place to reach persons who you know are are at disadvantage and they make use of the Sasa pay points on a monthly basis. So there is an opportunity there to communicate with 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 persons who don't have you know the requisite. Uh, infrastructure, the requisite data to be able to, for you to communicate with them um, on social media platforms. So there's a number of ways that, you know, we can, we can reach people. It just requires a coordinated and well thought out plan at the level of government and to, and in, and to do that in a way that they can decentralize it at the level of local government and municipalities in order to drive those things. You know, the problem is um, some of the aspirations are at a national level. They're at a national level and government has a plan, it has a policy and it really wants to get to its people. But if that plan 
is not connected to what's going on at the local level, at the lo uh, local municipality level, local government. That that's your engine for social. Uh, that's your engine for, for 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 service delivery. And if there's no proper connection between national government and local government, we have huge problems and we have pitfalls in wanting to communicate properly and wanting to reach our people effectively enough. So my appeal to to, to government particularly get to local government efficiently um, so that they can communicate and be your legs in getting to those people that are in far-flung areas that you yourself at a national level could not um, reach. I want to be a bit mischievous, um, Prof, and, and please, um, please um, bear with me on this issue. This whole notion of freedom of speech on social media. So your freedom of speech cannot infringe on my right to safety. It cannot infringe on my rights to be protected and to be a participant in society. I also have constitutional rights. So yes, you have the right to sit on your Twitter account and say what you must, but we have to balance that with the rights of persons to be safe, to be protected, to be members of society and to be able to participate safely in that society. So a person cannot have a whole Twitter rant targeting a particular minority group targeting a particular marginalized group, and we call that freedom of speech. I think we need to draw the lines and we need to draw them quite distinctively because we, we drive a message that a freedom of speech is paramount and it is higher than everybody else's right to safety. What happened the last two weeks is that people's right to safety was abused or people's rights to speech was abused. And as a result, people died. There are people who are still in morgues who have not been identified because your right to freedom of speech, you felt that it was more than somebody else's right to safety. So I think we need to really balance these issues because we can't just take one right and supersede all others. I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. I think the, the, the question is, um, so, so we have all these, there are all these things in the constitution, right? Inciting violence, you, you, you cannot do, right? I mean, you have freedom of speech, but you're not allowed to incite violence. Freedom of speech is not all, is not all encompassing, right? You, you can't be, you, you can't uh, have racist rants, okay? That's illegal, right? It, that's, that doesn't fall under freedom of speech. I think an, an, a really interesting question that needs to be addressed and explicitly addressed in, in, uh, in the constitution I, I, I honestly think is uh, an issue of whether uh, one can equate or at least uh, assign similarities between inciting violence, right, and spreading disinformation on vaccines, right? Because they're both harmful in similar ways, right? They, they, they both kill people. Um, so why, why shouldn't it be, um, why shouldn't spreading disinformation, and note I'm, I'm using disinformation and not misinformation here, uh, one is one is um, malicious with malicious intent, right? If you're spreading disinformation with malicious intent, uh, anti-vax information, and then you are then you are uh, ultimately killing people, uh, or potentially anyway. And why shouldn't that be treated the same as in, as inciting violence? I completely agree. It's not a freedom of speech issue, but but there is a freedom of speech issue here, right? Uh, but, but but it's it's complicated and nuanced, right? I, I certainly am not one of those people who thinks that anything, everyone should be able to say anything. No, not at all. Um, but nonetheless, uh, perhaps there, there's, there should be a call after this for us to e explicitly expand the legislature to include public health issues under something like inciting violence uh, or, or uh, protecting um, protecting the people or something. I don't know, an, another act or additions to an act. Um, yeah, uh, but, but I think you're quite right, for sure. Uh, okay, I'll ask one more question. Um, and who's the lucky person? I think it's Prof Radebe's turn. Uh, Prof, uh, the challenge is those who took the vaccine believe they can walk freely without wearing a mask in public. They are of the view that once vaccinated, you are immune. Uh, I suggest Dr. Crisp and his team need to correct this narrative, especially with international media reports indicating that the gamma variant is not responsive to the current vaccines. Um, uh, it's not so much a question, but maybe you have a maybe you have a comment to add. 
Absolutely. Actually, I agree with that comment uh, because it, it, these are some of the dangers. And I think part of the view stems from what we see on, on the television and our screens. I mean, people who are watching the European Cup and beginning to pose questions that these Europeans, they go to stadiums, they can fill the stadiums without masks. So it simply means that once we get vaccinated, we can walk freely. I think it is an important part uh, that as we communicate the vaccine rollout, we ensure that these messages are clearly articulated, uh, not just on social media platform, but also on the mainstream media. And I, I'm using the word mainstream very conser conservatively, that uh, where people get information so that they can understand, uh, they can understand that. But I think there was an important uh, uh, question, Ben, that uh, was posed to Prof, uh, Prof Maria, I don't think he saw it, uh, from Lumco that talks to the, the role of uh, and the power of journalists to set the agenda and unwittingly uh, driving wrong information. Um, and I think that, um, and, and, and when I say the point that the mainstream media, for example, becomes a, a reliable source of information because of, we you know, it's, it is regulated. That does not begin to denote the fact that they are, uh, they, they are the most progressive thing that we have uh, on, on planet. Uh, to the contrary, the, 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 the commercial media is precisely facing the same problem that uh, Prof. Mari was talking about. It is firmly located within the capitalist uh, production. And therefore, it, is, um, it drives particular interests, it drives particular ideological messages um, and therefore, part of training that Lumco is talking about in this question is very important. However, training alone won't address the problem because when you, when you are done with the training, you get located in the same media that is located within the capitalist production processes and therefore that reproduces the dominant ideology. So I think the, 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 the problem is, is much bigger. But I think there's consensus here that when you speak of freedom of expression, which is very important, it's a, it's a very thin line that we must be very careful. We don't want also to end up in a situation of an ED, I mean, that I can guarantee, freedom of speech is guaranteed, but I cannot guarantee freedom after speech, you know, kind of, a, a kind of thing. So I think it's very important that we must be able to balance all the importance um, if we are to, to defend and deepen uh, our democracy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I believe that's a wrap. The University of Johannesburg. The future reimagined.